Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations about money. Join your host, Lauren Williams, four-time Olympian turned financial planner, as her guests share their stories about how they manage money. We aim to help you own your personal money story and feel good talking about it. Lauren will teach you that money is a tool that can help you live the life you want. You should feel comfortable listening, sharing, and communicating about it. And now, here's your host, Lauren Williams. Hello, and welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren, and today's guest is UC Berkeley graduate, entrepreneur, and NFL Pro Bowl running back, Justin Forsett. A lot of people think that after making it to the NFL, life is all fame and fortune, but it just isn't true. Justin and I discuss his NFL journey, including what it was like to play for seven different teams over nine years, and the costs associated with all those frequent moves. Justin was also making moves off the field, though, and he helped create a wipe called Shower Peel that allows you to skip the shower after a workout and not be all stinky and germy. Now, don't act like you've never had to put your work clothes on after a workout because you were running late and didn't have time to take a shower. Of course, I could tell you more, but I feel like that's enough for me. Let's let Justin tell his money memoir. Justin, thanks for being on the show today. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Lauren. Well, let's just start from the beginning. Let's go back to where it all started for you, where you're from, your first memory of money, kind of what you felt or acknowledged about or kind of what you felt or understood about money in childhood? Yeah, I grew up in a small town, very humble beginnings, Mulberry, Florida, 3,000 people. Not a lot of people make it out to accomplish their dreams and goals and aspirations. But my first experience with money was with my grandmother. She was the church treasurer. She was a school teacher and she worked at a credit union. She would always take us out on Saturdays, me and my brothers, uh, to the mall to buy toys. She would give us $5 each, and we would go there, pick whatever we wanted, depending on what I saw at the store, KB Toys. I would decide if I was going to wait and save my money to buy something bigger or buy something small, but usually I bought something small because I was all about instant gratification. Uh (laughs) Aha. So you wouldn't say that you were a saver growing up. You were more of a spender. Yeah, it just depends on, you know, I would save the coins and the the stuff that folded, I would spend, you know, but (laughs) my grandmother gave me a piggy bank, so we would save a lot of coins. Gotcha. So you did, in the piggy bank sense of things, learn about the idea of putting some away for something and saving for a rainy day or for something else in the future. Sure, definitely. What about allowance? Did you have any allowance? Allowance? I told you I came from humble beginnings. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what an allowance was. You better go up there and clean them dishes and wash your clothes. <laughs> for allowance, you're trying to pay rent. Gotcha. But I mean, you're $5 every time. And you, you said you saved up for a toy. So it sounds like you came from humble beginnings, but you didn't really want for anything. Is that accurate? or? Well, I wouldn't say I didn't want for anything. But my grandmother, like I said, she was a big influence, a huge influencer in my life because my parents was always working. They worked hard and she would be home a lot of times and she would kind of would stay at her house and be with her. So especially on the weekend, she would give us a little small change, five dollars here and there, but we definitely had other issues at home financially. Gotcha. So what did you see then in your household about money then that you can recognize during your childhood? Just how much power it has. Like I said, it was very humble beginnings. We didn't have a lot. You know, my parents did a great job of working. My dad was a hard worker. But just sometimes good times, then there was some some bad times. Uh, there was some times where I remember taking baths with bottled waters. I remember running from the repo man, parking a car down the street, walking home, so a car would get repossessed. I remember at our very lowest, staying at a, a motel, basically homeless, with a two queen size bedroom at the uh, Super Eight Motel, and I made a declaration early on, like, man, I'm not going to allow my family to deal with these kind of struggles that I'm dealing with right now. So I was determined to make it out. I knew I wanted to be an NFL running back. So a guy named Barry Sanders one day said, man, I want to do that. And that was kind of my vision. I was like, man, I'm going to use football as a vehicle to get me where I want to be and to be able to provide for my family. Awesome. 
So how did you use football as a vehicle to be able to provide for your family? Let's fast forward a little bit then. What age did you start playing football? Let's stop there first. Uh, age seven, Mulberry Buccaneers. <laughs> the Mulberry Buccaneers. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So did you have promise from the very beginning? Uh, you excelled in football from the beginning or was it? Yeah. Yeah. I was out there and I excelled right away. I was kind of the the star, at least one of the stars on the team. And I knew I was kind of good at it. And I knew that was going to be my way out as far as I knew. What did the college process look like for you then? Because usually it's age group football in college and then the possibility of the pros. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole college experience, especially Transition from high school to college. I wasn't as heralded as you coming out of high school. I was short. I'm still short, but I was undersized for my position at running back. I wasn't the fastest guy on the field. I was just smart, quick, a great lateral movement. But everyone was saying I was too small to play D1 football. And I remember not being highly recruited, not having scholarship offers. And then after my all-star game in high school, when I moved to Texas, Notre Dame came in the picture and said, man, we're going to offer you a scholarship. I was excited. I was like, man, this is going to be awesome. It was like, God was putting everything together. I'm thinking, you know, touchdown Jesus. I'm thinking Golden Domers. I'm thinking Rudy. I'm like, man, I'm the black Rudy. This is what it's supposed to be like. And a you know, week before signing day, they called and told me they didn't need me anymore. So uh, I was heartbroken, crushed. I remember going out to my basement. It was right, one of the pivotal moments in my life where I was staying in the basement at my house, I remember getting down on my knees and crying because I was a believer at an early age. I was Christian. My faith was very important to me. I'm a PK. My dad's a preacher. So it was important. I remember I was kind of one of those kids. I was going to Bible study. I was going to church, in the choir, playing the drums, whatever it was, always in revivals. And I was like, God, I mean, you got to show me something. I can't do this anymore. I mean, I'm watching everybody around me get those blessings that I want. I've been desiring. I've been fighting for. I've been working for. I just can't do this anymore. I mean, you got to open up a door. And I remember him. This is one of those moments where I really know the guy was speaking to me. And I remember opening up my Bible. It was the only thing I knew how to do. And I got on my knees and he led me to Proverbs 3, 5, 6, which talks about trusting the Lord God with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your paths. And at that moment, I could feel the peace of God like on me, surrounding me him putting his arms around me and giving me that sense of peace. And I remember getting up, dusting myself off and like, I don't know what the future holds for me. I don't know what college I'm going to go to at this time. Signing day is February. You know, most people have their colleges that they're going to or at least have an idea what the next step is going to be. I didn't. I was just like, man, I'm just trust the process, have faith, keep working at it, excel at what I can control. And I want to say in May, UC Berkeley gave me a call. Cal gave me a call. I was like, man, I want to offer you a scholarship and it was crazy because it was actually, this is in May after their spring game and they're not giving out scholarships usually at this time. And somebody got hurt. It was a medical. So somebody had to take a medical shirt. And uh, so our scholarship just opened up and they offered me and I was in school. I had a place to play football. They continued my dream. What was the contingency plan, if you will? Like you said, you wanted to play football from a young age and you wanted to use football as a vehicle to help you achieve your dreams. So if college was the next step and football wasn't an option, because it was looking like it wasn't an option, was there some other plan in place in order for you to be able to go to college? Yes. Contingency plan. I was going to probably go to like a smaller school, like a D3 school or NAIA. My uncles went to South Carolina State, not to be confused with South Carolina or North Carolina State. This is, uh, I think, MEAC conference, basically HBCU. And I would have went there, but football was so still at that point in my life, that was my plan A, B, and C. Got it. So you were willing to go to a smaller school. I think that's a cool point to hit on is sometimes you get dead set on this one thing and, you know, D1 is like the ultimate goal to achieve. But when you have talent and ability that you can go to a smaller school and still get that free education and free is a lot better than taking on a lot of debt to get an education. So, Man, Albaline Christian told me I could walk on and there was no way I was going to do that. I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so college ball went well for you. Talk a little bit about how you handle money in college and what that looked like. Uh, man, money in college was tough. I mean, I went to UC Berkeley. That's in Bay Area, Silicon Valley. It's expensive. We had to stay in the dorms our first year, and I moved out because I wanted to be my own man. I wanted to be uh, self-reliant and all that stuff, kind of handle my own 
bills and all that stuff. But I remember $1,500 a month for rent. And I would just take my check that I would get to pay for my bills, like electricity, utilities, or whatnot, and the rent. And that would be all gone. So food, during the off season, I would just have to use our little, at that time, was we had like a little swipe car. I want to say that we can go get meal plans. I would use a, a friend or buddies or, and during the off season, I would work. I was a bouncer. You can, might not be able to tell it. I know my stature might say otherwise that I should be a bouncer. But I would toss you out of the club if I saw you with white tees on and some sneakers. It was just a job where you can really pay for some incidentals and stuff that you need and food because my check that I get would really take care of the bills and the utilities and rent. So I had to have another income stream and bouncing was it. I think that brings up a really good point about one of the myths that college athletes have. It's so great and it's so easy. And of course, a full scholarship is a blessing, but that it's not enough money sometimes to go above and beyond what your basic needs are. And so I think it's interesting that you had to work in addition to the stipend that you were earning as a college athlete. And two, like you said, you brought up the cost of living in California where it's very different depending on what state an athlete decides to go to school in. Yeah, no, it's important. I mean, my mindset was I had to hustle and plus not only take care of my bills, like I have to send some money back for my folks just to kind of make ends meet as well. I would get calls every once in a while, just like, man, you know, we're family. We need some help. We need to kind of struggle in this area. So I had to take some of that money and push it down to them. So it was important that I always maintain some source of income. For sure. Can you talk a little bit about the transition from college to the professional world? Yeah, sure. So going to a university like UC Berkeley, it really helps you, you know, with the, help me with the transition because you have to have time management skills. It's competitive on and off the field in the classroom and, you know, in sports. So it really pushes you to really grow up really fast and uh, be accountable for some of the things. And so the transition for me being able to handle things on my own was pretty smooth. There was still a little bit of learning curve just because I was the seventh round draft pick. I drafted by the Seattle Seahawks and I signed a bonus was like maybe $30,000, which was, you know, a lot of money to me, but it's not in the grand scheme of things. It wasn't the biggest check out there in the draft. So I had to make good use of that money, be a good steward over it. But I wasn't expecting the kind of whirlwind that I had my rookie year. I don't think anybody can prepare for it. I ended up making the team for Seattle. Had a great training camp and preseason and made the team for week one. And I remember getting a call. I was in the barber shop and it was a call from the Seahawks facility saying, we need to come in. We're going to release you. We need to get somebody healthy. We got some people hurt at receiver. So we need somebody, a healthy receiver that we need to bring up. So we got to let you go. So I got let go. And I mean, this is after. I brought my girlfriend, who's my wife now, signed a lease to an apartment in Renton, Washington, by the facility. And we put the furniture in there. We got beds, and couches, all this stuff in there. Ended up getting released. And after I get released, the Indianapolis Colts picked me up. So like two days later, I had to fly out to Indianapolis. It means I had to break that lease and I'm moving to a whole nother city and I find a way to sell my furniture at a cheaper value than when I got it. And you know, hopefully pray somebody take over the lease, but no one did at the time. So just a lot of money lost right there. Let's pause right there for a second. What did you know about money at this point? What would you say in the natural progression of things? What did you learn over college? Was there a personal finance class in the draft process? Was there a financial planner or a financial advisor or someone like that that tried to take you under their wing or that you hired? As a seventh round pick, do people kind of flock toward you in the way that you hear that people flock toward the bigger athletes? Uh, yeah. So I had an advisor. Of course, I had my agent. I had a financial advisor. And I also had someone like a mentor from Cal, from Berkeley. To I mean, just tell me the importance of, you know, NFL stands for not for long. So you got to make your money stretch and work for you. For me, coming in at that moment and going through all those different obstacles, I was like, man, these are things that are really out of my control. Like I'm trying to save, I'm trying to do the cheap options and things, but now I'm moving from one place to the next. I had to break a lease and I'm getting this furniture. I think it was 
court furniture, rental furniture, whatnot. Well, no, actually, I bought that time. So I had to sell the furniture and it was just tough. So my advisors, they were just saying, man, you make sure you be responsible with your money. Uh, but those were kind of like unforeseen circumstances that came about. And I just had to respond by trying to be even more diligent with my funds that I was getting in. Gotcha. All right. So then you went on, you said to Indy. So I went to Indy and I'm going there and I'm excited. I'm playing for Tony Dungy, Peyton Manning, all this stuff. And I'm like, man, this is awesome. This is Super Bowl champs. And I'm there for like a month and a half and I'm driving. I can't remember where I was. I got a place. I'm renting another place out in Indianapolis. This time I rent furniture, but I get released on Tuesday as I'm driving, get something to eat. They told me to come in. We want to release you. We got to get somebody healthy at cornerback position and uh, we got to bring somebody up. So I'm just out in the cold again. And now I have now broken two leases, spent extra money on furniture that I can't take with me. So I have that issue, that loss. And then I get called that next day by the Seattle Seahawks saying, uh, we're going to sign you back. So I fly back to Seattle and I ended up spending the rest of my contract out there. You finished your season in Seattle and... What happens next? So I finished my rookie year. I ended up spending the rest of my contract out next four years in Seattle. But that first year was tough because just some instability. I had to break two leases. You know, I bought a car and I was basically roughing it that first rookie season. Like a college student, I had to cook my own meals, George Foreman grill, and then go on the safe way, trying to cook as much as I can to make my money stretch because you don't get paid during January, during the off-season. But when off-season program starts, you get like $200, $300 a week. So I was kind of just like, just trying to rough it to make it to that point where I can get some income in. Thank God that I was able to make a stretch. I ended up getting to the point where, okay, I got the $200, $300 from the Seahawks to work out, but it was tough. You got to make a stretch. So I'm going through those issues. And my mom got cancer. Uh, Her cancer came back, thyroid cancer. So I'm sending medical stuff or trying to send money back to them for help. So. Did you get to keep the signing bonus that you talked about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I was able to allow to everything to stretch a little bit longer. Like other guys weren't as fortunate. Gotcha. Can you talk a little bit about, like you said, you said you hired a financial advisor, kind of what his strategy was or how he helped you in this first year with all the different expenses that you were incurring and helping you figure that out? Yeah, just one thing that he was constantly pressing on me is that this is common. Don't freak out. You can still recover from this. So just on a mental capacity, just encourage me and keep me uplifted was important. But also like, man, we just got to be very strategic, conservative with our finances. And so like investing different things that come across your desk or people pitching to you, you just can't do. You got to save at this point. Did you have a lot of people reaching out to you because you were in the NFL and they assumed that you were filthy rich? And can you talk about what that experience was like, what the environment was around you? Of course, you got people, friends, you know, family needing things or pitching ideas or you're in the city and they know you're playing on Sunday. And at this point in Seattle, I was playing a lot. And so my name was face was recognizable and people coming to choose these opportunities, whether it's real estate tech or whatever it is. I mean, at that time, you know, Seattle was kind of, it's it's still a hotbed for a lot of like what's next and like investing and venture capital. You know, they have Amazon up there, they have Microsoft up there. They had a whole bunch of things that was going on, opportunities that were before you. But for me and where I was financially, I just couldn't risk being in any of those things. Okay. So take us through the rest of your career. You said you stayed in Seattle for four years, but you ended up being on a few other teams during your career. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you learned through that process and what it was like bouncing around and the expenses associated with that as well? Yeah, it's uh, I call it an unstable blessing, man. It was unstable because I just had to pick up and take my family place to place, but it was a blessing because I got a chance to do what I love to do and provide. But first stop after Seattle was, I was in Houston for a year. Then I went to Jacksonville for a year. Then I was getting ready to transition out of football because I was like, man, if I can't play for the Jacksonville Jaguars, I mean, who else is going to give me a shot? So I ended up getting a call from Baltimore, which my head coach for the Houston Texans was now the office coordinator for Baltimore. So he brought me on. They had a whole situation with Ray Rice that came about. So they needed extra running back. And I came in and 
had my best season to that point. So that allowed me, afforded me the opportunity. I went to the Pro Bowl. I was top five rusher. All these accolades that I was kind of been fighting for my whole career happened in year seven of my career with the Baltimore Ravens. And then I signed my big contract with the Ravens that following season. And I spent two more years there, one and a half. And then I finished up that last season before I retired was Baltimore, Denver, and Detroit. So can you talk a little bit about how you set your goals and your priorities during the time period? You know, all this bouncing around, I think, would make even the strongest person a little bit uneasy. And definitely it makes for fluctuating income and a lot of things that you didn't know that you couldn't forecast into the future if you were getting a one-year deal or something like that. So can you talk a little bit about how you set your goals and how you set your priorities in the midst of kind of an unstable environment? Yeah. So for me, I always had to kind of think about the end because I was let go so many times. I was fired so many times. So I kind of found out what my passion was. One was I want to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to be able to provide business opportunities for my community. And I started the company Shower Pill while I was playing and then also speaking. So I would travel around and speak during the off season, which provided me another stream of income. And it was also something I was passionate about. So I had to think about the end. And my goal was to use football and that platform as a stepping stool to kind of propel me into the next phase and chapter. That's kind of where I was looking at it. And then all of a sudden, year seven happens. I have the biggest year, my biggest season, and I get that big contract I was looking for. But my mission and goal is still the same. That's awesome. Can we talk a little bit about what you learned earlier on in your career about the NFL's retirement plan and how to set things up there? Like you said, in the midst of kind of bouncing around, like there's still some retirement options available to you with each team you make. Can you talk about the options that the NFL provides and how you decided to create a strategy around setting money aside for the future? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So always investing. I mean, 401k, you know, the team matches what you put in. So up to a certain number. And I always just because I had good veterans around me, good people on staff. I was like, man, this is something you got to do. You're not getting this in any other industry. So this is something you do. So I always invested in that 401k for us. That's life after football and retirement. Every year, always made the maximum I could put in. And just trying to be a good steward, planning for the end. Like I, I was still conservative in investment. I wasn't one of those guys that was going to take a lot of risk, municipal bonds, whatever it is. It was like real conservative. And my company that I run, that's kind of the risky uh, alternative investment that I had because, you know, that's, uh, you start a business that's, you know, private equity. I mean, you can't get more risky than that. I mean, <laughs> I think it's a good transition into what you're up to now. And tell us a little bit more about Shower Pill. So, yeah, Shower Pill is a basically, I mean, two bags. What is the Shower Pill? What's that? We get a name from. So, it's a name from the locker room. People knew that there was pills for everything, but no pills for a shower. So guys, if they had to skip a shower after a workout, they said, man, I took a shower pill, bro, don't judge me. So we turned that joke into a business. And we knew that athletes, that at least more athletes than you imagine, don't shower directly after a sweat, drench workout or practice, not immediately after. It's not because they want to be stinky or dirty. It's just because their schedules, you know, dynamic. Like, I mean, you got to go to practice or workout. You go into meetings, you know, interviews, do a whole bunch of things before you can get to a shower. And we have recommendations from CDC that you need to shower, you know, at least a certain amount of time right after a workout to prevent like cross-contamination of the diseases like you can catch in a locker room, like staff, a ringworm, a mercer. So we want to create a solution for those moments and those people like us are athletes or active individuals. So we created this shower in a wipe, this body wipe created by our company Shower Pills. So uh, that's kind of where we start. That's really interesting. Can you talk a little bit about the process in starting the business and what that looked like? I think a lot of people are interested in becoming entrepreneurs, but they feel like the process to get started on your own business is such a hard or tedious process that they don't have that option. So can you talk about the actual startup process? Yeah. So I will say this, that entrepreneur, first off, is I know it's a very sexy term, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. I'm spending a lot more time than I ever did playing football with the business. So but yeah, we started, I have two other business partners. Well, all three of us played football at Cal. So while I was playing football, they were kind of handling the business side of things. It was, it was important to have good partners. And then one of them played football for two years in Buffalo, but then went into the EMT in uh, the Bay Area as it worked as an EMT in the hospital. And the other is a lieutenant of fire in the Oakland Fire Department. So they knew like kind of the things that we wanted to 
put into this concept and idea, like uh, what kind of properties we want. We want the properties of a shower. We want to be able to clean and nourish the skin. So we're like, okay, where do we go? What kind of manufacturers? We kind of look navigating through manufacturing industry, like who can create this the best product for us. So we Google uh, making calls, tap into our resources, see how we can get it done. We ended up partnering with a great manufacturer, getting a filing for LLC. And basically it was off to the races. I mean, it's pretty, uh, I'll say that the process of just getting it all up and running probably took maybe a year, six months to a year uh, at that time to get everything kind of legalized or whatnot. Trademark is for actually running, running the business because we all were doing, you know, separate things. It's kind of like a part-time job. We didn't really start really going like full tilt into like 2014. And that's when we kind of really hit the ground running. But the process ever growing, running your business, ever growing, ever learning. It's been a, a wild ride. Uh-huh. Have you made any mistakes or had any bad experiences that <laughs> you want to share? <laughs> yes. So when we're in a CPG space, so that is consumer packaged goods space. So when you think about, uh, okay, a body wipe or a shower and a wipe, who could use it? You know, athletes could use it, youth sports, youth athletes, military, camping, hiking, people that travel a lot, all these different use cases. And as a young company, one of the things that we got caught up with is, is that if you don't have product market fit, then you can be distracted a lot of the times by all these different verticals that are opportunities that you have. You don't really find that niche or like your market first. Early on, we got to call ourselves into making that mistake. Like, okay, man, we can't be everything to everybody right off the bat. We got to kind of own our lane and our vertical and kind of stay focused on that, at least establishing in that path, establishing our customer and our community first before moving on. So that was one of the kind of the big mistakes. We were just trying to do too much early on. Right. Okay, so can you talk about what the hardest thing is about entrepreneurship? Oh, man. I'd say right now for me, me personally, I have other partners uh, that probably would say different things, but I'm in charge of raising capital, you know, kind of fundraising part. And that stuff is just tough for me because I never personally like asking people for money. Uh, I like to stay in my own pockets. So naturally, I'm just not that usually that guy, but I've just kind of learned that there's, you know, kind of like a strategy behind it. You know, most people... When you're raising capital, you're trying to stop, get funds for your business. Like they're betting on the jockey, not necessarily the horse. So you can have a great product, but they want to make sure that you can move the product, you know, and the great people behind it. So just building relationships has been important. Like you, you don't want to really sell too hard. And, you know, that was something that I feel like I was doing early on, which was like really tough because like you can sell, you meet somebody for five minutes and you, or 10 minutes, you get an elevator pitch or whatnot. But that doesn't guarantee that that deal is going to come through. I mean, you got to spend time nurturing that relationship and kind of getting them a sense of who you are in business. And it's usually how that works. But it's getting a lot better for me now. But I still, I'm just not a fan of just asking people for money. Speaking of asking people for money, you had an opportunity to go on Shark Tank, right? Yeah. <laughs> and ask some big wigs for some money. So, yep, we went on Shark Tank. So I knew... I wanted to make a big splash in retirement, my announcement, because I wanted to help me propel my business down only, you know, tell people like, you know, I'm retired for football, but I want to let them know this is the next chapter in my life. So if you want to join in, I want you to know what I'm doing. So I'm not going to be one of these guys that's in the corner, not knowing what they're doing because football has become their identity. So one, I had a video release. I have a bunch of guys sending me off in my retirement, showing kind of love and giving some words about me. And then the second piece was we did an article my company in tandem with my company uh, about our business and then like the next chapter, like what I'm doing and doing that story. We released it through Bleacher Report and it went viral. And when uh, CNN picked it up, like every, almost all the outlets, like this athlete inventor, we created this product. And one of the people that reached out was one of the producers for Shark Tank. And it was like, man, are you interested in raising capital? And I was like, yeah. Very much so. (laughs) Very much so. So they was like, man, you come on the show. So we go through the whole process, which is very complex and long. It's just think of the SAT on steroids and whatever mm-hmm. test you would take. But just a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of paperwork to get on there. A lot of steps. But we got on, and uh, we got on the show. We didn't have success in getting the money, 
But long story short, we got on there and we fumbled the number side of the business. And my partner, being able to communicate the financial storyline behind the business, he wasn't able to speak that clearly enough. So they passed on that regard, but loved the product and idea. So really had some great sound bites on just kind of the product and the kind of the use cases from Lori Grenier and Barbara, who were on the show, if you're familiar with the show. And once it aired, the product stuff was awesome. So our sales after the show aired was crazy. It still is to this day. It's like, I mean, 8X of you know what we were normally doing. So, and people are reaching out all over the country, like investors, partners, retailers, gyms, like, man, love to have you on board. So it ended up working out in our favor, but it was, uh, it was kind of quite the experience. So what's the one thing you would tell people who are interested? Like, oh, like, if I just get on Shark Tank, I'll be good. I'll be good. Life will be all right. What would you do differently having gone through that process already if you were somebody who was interested in going through that process? Well, you better have your numbers straight. That's the number one rule of Shark Tank. To be honest with you, my partner that was trying to communicate, it's unlike any experience that you've ever been in. Even me being a pro athlete, been out there, it's been in TV for doing TV for a long time, done broadcasting, been on NFL Network and all those things. And uh, it was still kind of nerve wracking being out there. So you take somebody like my partner trying to explain the numbers. And we know we all have our script and lines that we're trying to remember while we're in there. And uh, it was just nerve wracking. He was nervous and he slipped up. But you have to know that when you're in the tank. So if you even thinking about it, that's the first thing that you have to do. But it's a great vehicle for you to kind of get your brand or whatever you're doing out there because you get five to seven million viewers looking at your business. That's awesome. All right, let's wrap up. Earlier in the show, you talked a little bit about being a preacher's kid and a Christian. Can you talk a little bit about how you govern your funds and, like you said, how you're a good steward of your money because of your biblical beliefs? Yeah, definitely. So I definitely try to be a good steward and make sure I'm using my money to serve and I'm not serving my money. Make sure that I'm prayerful about everything that I'm investing in or giving to. So I do a lot of help, things in the community, whether it's we as a family uh, giving back to our, our community and needs or the business going out to places like Puerto Rico or Houston hit by hurricanes and Flint, Flint Michigan and water crisis. So doing that as well as, you know, paying my tithes, you know, just honoring God with my first fruits of everything that I get. It's like, man, it's not about the money. It's just like, God, this is for you. Like, I know it's not, I'm just here managing it, but you're the one that's providing it for me. So just be prayerful about everything and trying to be a good steward, take care of it and using my money and not allowing it to use me has been very important. Yeah, let's circle back to the tithing question. Have you been a consistent tither like for the duration of your career? I know a lot of times some people are good tithers when they have less, but then they get a lot and they're like, woo, 10% of all of this? Hold on now. Yeah. And being faithful during the time period when the check gets a lot larger, it might be easier in some people's eyes to give up 10%, but a lot of times you start seeing a bigger 10% and you're like, I don't know about this. Yeah, uh, I've been consistent since day one uh, when I stepped to the league just tithing uh, because I knew where all of it came from. Like uh, it was God opening up doors and I wanted to honor him by giving him those first fruits. Remember that he's the priority. So that's kind of what I've been doing since day one. Awesome. All right. So now we're headed into our, uh, Kelly told me to call it a, Actually, I think I called it a blitz on his show because I've been calling it like a lightning round. But I was like, lightning round is lame. (laughs) I'm going to call it a no huddle. All right. There we go. Two minutes. Yes. The no huddle round. Get ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. You have $20 in your pocket right now. What do you spend it on? Oh, man. Something for my wife. It's Valentine's Day. It is Valentine's Day. Your best money habit. Oh, I'm a saver. I'm I, I, maybe bad because I'm a hoarder. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> what would you say is your worst money habit then? Oh man, food. I like eating out. Ah, that's a common one among athletes. Yeah. Something you do for fun that doesn't cost anything. Mm. Spend time with my, my kids. Worst advice you've ever received. Do as I say. Do don't do as I do. Ah, best advice you've ever received. Uh, If you live for people's acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. The best thing about being an athlete? Oh, man, the platform. Uh, It just presents a whole bunch of opportunity. 
you know, especially if you want to start your business, you can get open up doors with just because you had the NFL shield on you for a few years. So that's probably the best part. Awesome. And last but not least, we have a model here at Worth Winning. It is that it's not about the numbers, but about the strategy. So we focus sometimes way too much on the amount or counting what's in someone else's pocket instead of really focusing on the knowledge that's needed to gain the experience and really understanding and get the kind of growth that you need to grow financially. So with that said, our final question is, can you share one thing that you would like to improve about your finances in the upcoming year? I always say like most of my life, I've been uh, conservative, especially my career with some of my spending habits, but I want to be a little more uh, diversified in uh, my portfolio. I think that's important now that I have enough income in now. I want to be strategic about it, but being able to take a little more risk than I've normally had just to diversify. What's the action item to help you actually achieve your goal? For me, I'm interested in real estate. So finding someone that that's their space and they find kind of like that, that mentor that can really help me because I want to leave it to the experts to help me, not me going out and trying to learn on my own and try to figure it out. So that'd be the action item. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show today, Justin. Can you just tell the audience where they can find you, how they can help you, support you? Yes, you can find me on all social media platforms at J4Set. You can follow ShowerPill at ShowerPill on all platforms. If you want to hire me for speaking, it's J4Set.com. All right. Well, thanks for being on the show today. Uh, Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed listening to Justin's Money Memoir. We learned a lot from Justin today. Our word of the day is steward. Justin mentioned several times throughout the interview how important it was for him to be a good steward of his money. A steward is someone that has the responsibility to take care of something. You may have heard it frequently in church, but that's the true meaning of the word, the responsibility to take care of something. I think it's important that we realize our financial stability is dependent on our ability to be responsible for managing each and every dollar that we earn. There's this wise saying that you should tell your money where to go, otherwise you'll be wondering where it went. I think sometimes we get caught up in how to get more or making more, or what can we do to have more instead of truly focusing on taking care of what we have. If you want to live a life worth winning, then you need a plan for managing your finances from the very beginning. If you want help organizing your finances, or have financial questions, suggestions for guests, or would like to share your money memoir, please contact us through our website, worth-winning.com. Thanks for tuning in today. We hope you found this episode worth listening to.